Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford, and in this video, a continuation of my Ranch Porch series, I will be discussing a, uh, a story that I used to tell as a comedy, the story of my severe head injury and, the, uh, and, and concussion and the chronic condition that I developed because of it. I share this story with you not because it's one of my finest moments, it isn't. It is at least uh, <laughs> not the story of a coward, perhaps, but uh, it is not a not something I boast about. In fact, the fight itself, which was pretty stupid, uh, is a story that for the past it is twelve years now that I've been teaching independently at, at American universities. So for the past twelve years, I've been telling it to class after class, semester after semester, because. You know, I teach huge classes that uh, account for general education credits, and so there's always some students that inevitably are going to hate you. And I figure that, uh, especially around exam time, some of those students need a little bit of catharsis by hearing a story about me getting the tar beaten out of me, something that they can't do. For social, if not physical, reasons. So, uh, I'll, I'll preface this by saying that uh, as a teenager, I had absorbed uh, generations of stories about my very combative family. Uh, every generation of my family on my father's and my mother's side has consisted of men who were in many fights. Um, I often enjoyed these stories. I, uh, and, and these stories, by the way, you only have to go back two generations before they're gunfights, right? I mean, my great-grandfather, Crawford, was a was an old-time sheriff who was shot by an outlaw i mean these are this is this is the heritage that i soaked up and and frankly um that that fed into uh, you know I, I hate to use the word fantasy so soon after mentioning the murder of my direct ancestor but certainly if i didn't fantasize about being murdered i fantasized about the shootout with outlaws right so uh anyway enter me about 15 years old in high school, sophomore. Uh, I will not tell you anything that would reveal what high school this was. <laughs> I will not tell you anything that would reveal the identity of the person that I futilely fought. Um, I will not tell you his name. Um, I will call him Jesse because that is nothing like his real name and I hate that name for unrelated reasons. So, Jesse sat behind me in my Latin class. I know this does not sound like a likely setup for a fight. And he was six foot three, um, big man. Um, you know, he was 18, a senior, um, d definitely uh, built uh, solider than me, and especially at the time. And, uh, he, he had a lot of fights on the weekends. He was part of kind of a fight club. I think that movie had already come out. And, and so there was kind of this, this fight club at my high school. Guys would get together on the weekends and they would have fights. And I'm restarting this video because I accidentally said his real name. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so Jesse was part of this sort of fight club at my high school where guys would get together and, and have fights. Um, and uh, he won a lot. Um, and so he uh, was bragging this one Monday, I think, and you'll see in a few minutes why I'm a little bit unclear about some of this. I believe that this was in November of 2000. Um, most of the data that I have, actually, because nobody remembers this. As, it, I mean, I, I don't remember the fight, right? But nobody, in nobody else's life was this as significant a moment as it was in mine. So by the time that I realized what a significant moment this was, and not just a story to tell, um, I had lost the ability to figure out exactly when it happened, kind of. Um, so I think it was November 2000. Um, there was something else that made me think it might have been January 2001. At any rate, it was during that school year, like I said, when I was a sophomore in high school. Uh, so um, anyway, Jesse's coming into class uh, this morning sitting down right behind me like he, because like, like, it's his assigned seat, 
And, uh, you know, I didn't have uh, anything to do with the guy. Um, not that he picked on me or anything either, right? But um, he, uh, he sits down, he's bragging about beating this guy over the weekend, and, and he says something to the effect of, you know, now I am definitely the best fighter in the school. Well, at the time, just like now, I had a somewhat wry, ironic, tongue-in-cheek sense of humor. People often have a hard time telling what I'm joking, um, especially if they don't know me well. So I turned to him, and the whole class, you know, a lot of people in the class do know my sense of humor. But, I, I, but Jesse doesn't. Um, so I, uh, I say, you know what, Jesse, I think... I'm the best fighter in the school. All right. He does not realize I'm joking. And he says, seriously, dog? I mean, several other people laughed. Uh, and so at this point, I thought, oh, no. Right, my honor is on the line. So I said, yeah, sure, I'll fight you. And he said, you know, all right. Um, let's do this uh, a week from Tuesday at... Uh, Hold on, let me make up a name for this park that I can sort of remember. Let's call it Pine Park. Okay. At Pine Park. All right. Well, um, you know, much like a man challenged to a duel in, in a Western or in an Icelandic saga, I realized that I had, uh, had, had a destiny here to fulfill that backing out of this would be terrible. And in fact, um, this event began to be advertised um, in the school parking lot as the spark in the park. So, you know, I couldn't back out. Um, and so I spent the week uh, as someone with no hand-to-hand -hand combat training whatsoever. Um, you know, um, uh, punching punching bags and stuff like that in, in, in friends' basements. Um, but I knew I was going to lose this fight. Although there was also a part of me, right? Um, a part of me that had probably watched too many John Wayne movies, too many Clint Eastwood movies, read too many, too many of those kinds of novels that thought that because I was the quote unquote good guy that I actually had a chance just because, you know, the universe would favor me or whatever. Um, anyway, the day of the fight, came that that following Tuesday eight days later and uh, so that afternoon after school I handed my friend Jared um, the keys to my parents house and I said when I get knocked out I want you to just drop me off at my parents house and he said all right so we drove to the park uh, where this was supposed to happen and there was nobody there Turned out later, I found out that uh, the Latin teacher had overheard enough of this to report to the cops what was about to happen there. And so the cops had come and busted this group of guys that were waiting for me to show up and fight Jesse. But his brother shows up, circles around our car and says, uh, you know, the cops busted us, so we had to move to this other park. We had to move to Rock Park, all right? So we followed him over to Rock Park. And um, there, of course, we find this ring of guys. There are about 65 there. They're throwing a football, right? Like, that's what they're there for, <laughs> acting nonchalant. And I get out of this car, and um, they form into a circle. And in the middle of that circle, there's... Jesse kicking and, and doing all these fancy martial arts things. And uh, I take off my hat, I hand it to Jared, and uh, you know, I already wore the hat and was sort of noted for that, so Jesse calls me Chuck Norris and says, hey, all right, Chuck Norris, you ready to go? And uh, I said, well, I think I'm about as ready as I'm gonna be. And my last memory is squaring off in some imitation of a boxing pose. And then my next memory after that is I'm lying on the couch at my parents' house with Jared wiping the blood out of my face. 
and I have a raging headache, and I am vomiting and bleeding from so many places that I, I am seeing red. And, uh, and I'm asking Jared, did I get any good hits in? Well, Jared says, I'm concerned because that's, I, I've counted, that's the, the 17th time you've asked that. Um, yes, you got a few hits in. And I said, well, all right. That was the main thing I was concerned about, right? So I said, all right, Jared, get out of here right before my parents get home. So, I mean, I'm just vomiting. I'm a mess of blood. Um, so I go and I take a shower. Um, and then I lie back down on the couch and I vomit some more and bleed some more. Um, and then my mom comes home. She says, oh, my God, what happened to you? And I said, I fell down the stairs. Well, she believes me. But she notices that I'm severely injured. So she uh, calls my dad to come home early. My dad comes home, puts me in the truck, and on the way over to the ER, he says, I just want to know one thing, because I know you didn't fall down the stairs. What does this other guy look like? And I said, I don't remember. And that was true. Um, I still don't remember the fight. I, like I said, my memory skips from squaring off to being on the couch. And um, that is just based on how far the park was from the house. That is 25 minutes up to 45 minutes away. Um, so I have up to 45 minutes, at least 25 minutes of lost time, which we all should have seen as a warning sign given that I was concussed. Anyway, um, we get to the ER, we wait and wait. Um, you know, the doctor finally sees me, sews up all these scars. I don't rem or what would become scars. Um, I don't remember um, if he suggested that I get an MRI or a CAT scan or something, but whatever the case, uh, if he suggested it, I refused it or something. At any rate, I never had any kind of brain scan at, at this time. And uh, he did call the cops because just from the little bit of my story that I told the ER doctor who's looking at this guy who's just been, just been, you know, who's gotten, the, like I said, the tar beaten out of him, um, he's decided that I was, I was assaulted. And so the cops show up, these two guys, and they asked me, you know, to tell the story. So I told them what I could recall of it at the time. I recall a little bit more now. And um, so at the end, this cop is looking at me kind of bored. He's got his notebook out, and he said, so what you're telling me is that you weren't assaulted. You actually volunteered for this. And I said, yes. And he closes his notebook, and he says, so you're not a victim. You're just a dumbass. And I, <laughs> I said, yes. And that was the first of two times so far in my life a cop has said that to me. Um, the second one is a completely different story. So I go to bed looking like a mummy with my head wrapped up. I go to school the next day and I show up in the classroom, the Latin classroom. It was my second class of the day. Um, everyone is silent. And I'm there before Jesse is. Jesse comes in a little bit after me. Like I said, I look like a mummy because I'm wrapped up so much. He has a single bandage over one of his earlobes and it turned out that something I did ripped out one of his earrings right I'd like to think it was this it was probably that <laughs> but at any rate I did some damage to him um, and he just sits down and says you know what I respect you dog <sighs> for what that's worth I mean I I never dealt with bullies afterward, maybe because I seemed too persistent or something. <sighs> but, uh, all right. So, the consequences of this were much longer lasting. I had no idea until 2016 what this had done to me uh, permanently in terms of actual lasting damage. But what happened, I, I, I mean, it's hard to tell as a, as, a, as a narrative form exactly, but
but um, my pituitary gland right on the bottom end of my brain was damaged in this in this fight it, it manifested that Jesse had actually kicked me in the head several times including after I was down um, and my friend Jared had had to pull him off of me so who knows how much more damage might have been done but that's probably when I sustained the, the damage to my pituitary gland it was somehow scarred or something um, the most recent neurosurgeon who looked at the most recent MRI uh, said there's probably not a tumor there a, a non-cancerous tumor as previous specialists had suspected but there's some kind of scarring or something that that damaged it so what happened is 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 you know these these 18 years later uh, I have uh, low normal levels of a lot of hormones that the pituitary gland produces. I'm not talking about testosterone, ladies. I'm talking about, like, th things I don't even know the function of, you know, luteinizing pro protein or hormone or whatever. You know, I, I don't really understand most of these. But critically, over the, the subsequent 15 years or so after this fight, um, my pituitary gland um, uh, gradually stopped producing antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin. So I developed the condition that is called diabetes insipidus. So um, this is not related to what we typically call diabetes, which is diabetes mellitus. Um, by my understanding, both diabetes mellitus, which is classical diabetes, a, a glucose problem, and then my condition, diabetes insipidus, um, were named in the 19th century by the same scholars. Uh, they called both conditions diabetes, which, and of course diabetes mellitus was rarer then. Um, diabetes insipidus is exceedingly rare, but diabetes mellitus was rarer than it is today. Uh, they called both conditions diabetes because that's Greek for, for sieve, right, pass through, diabetes. Um, and then um, uh, mixing Greek and Latin, they called the form of um, uh, the, the glucose-based one, uh, diabetes mellitus, sweet, sieve, and they called uh, my condition diabetes insipidus, so insipid, empty, tasteless uh, sieve, because um, the urine that people with my condition produce is basically identical to water. And what this condition is, is because I lack the hormone, antidiuretic hormone, that actually retains water in the human body. Um, if I'm not medicated with an artificial form of the hormone that I take as a nose spray, or, or it can be taken as a pill, or by IV, Anyway, if I'm not medicated with that artificial form of the hormone, um, I don't retain liquid at all. So um, I urinate every 15 minutes, and in an average day, I'll urinate five gallons, even if I'm not drinking. Um, it's it's it severely hampers normal living. So um, I also had some some um, you know I, I I so 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 to kind of stay on that topic for a moment. Over the next 15 years, I mean, I could tell that this was becoming a problem, right? It became very hard for me to participate in sports already in high school because I had to urinate so much and because I fainted, right? Because, I, it, which, you know, damn, that was one of the worst things for, for uh, you know, a young man to deal with was, was, just, was just fainting all the time because, <laughs> you know, I couldn't keep water in my system. Um, uh, but I didn't know, right? I had no clue what the actual condition was. So I kind of slowly backed away from a lot of physical activities that, that I wanted to participate in, right? This kept me from doing a lot of stuff that I might otherwise. And it, it, it might have shaped my career path in ways that I haven't really fully appreciated until recently. Um, because I looked for activities um, and, and pursuits uh, to focus on that were pretty solitary because it was really embarrassing to use the bathroom all the time, right? Um, so, uh, by 2003 or so, uh, I could tell that there, that I urinated a lot more than your average person, um, and I was constantly thirsty. Um, and by 2005, it was definitely a serious problem. But I thought, you know, I just thought that I was 
that I had a hard time holding it, right, relative to other people. I just blamed myself as being weak, right? But I couldn't figure out a way to, to stop. And, um, you know, it gradually got worse and worse. Definitely by 2015 or so, I was not producing the hormone at all because, like, it had become where I could not hold it longer than 15 minutes. Um, it, was, it was severe. Well, I got a job, um, a second job. I mean, I was working at the University of California, Berkeley in 2015. But I was making so little money and paying so much in rent and, and just daily living expenses that I needed some other jobs. This is before I started making videos and, and I had Patreon and before um, my books started uh, coming to, to, to wider attention and, and selling well enough to supplement my income. Uh, so... I briefly took a job as a historical reenactor in San Francisco. I will not discuss that further. It was very brief. But one problem that that was severe with this job was um, we only got bathroom breaks every two hours. I couldn't handle it. I mean, not to mention the hour sucks, but I couldn't handle that, right? And I tried drinking less, and of course when I drank less, I just fainted. And I, and I still urinated the same amount. So, um, you know, I ended up having to quit that job. But then I realized, okay, I have, there is something medically wrong here. So then I saw, um, um, well, my good friends, uh, Joe and Candy Turner and, and, and back in Wyoming, our, our medical doctors, um, they gave me uh, some, they did some blood work, which revealed that I had this condition, diabetes insipidus. Um and uh, so I saw an endocrinologist in San Francisco who confirmed the diagnosis and began prescribing me vasopressin, the artificial form of the hormone, which uh, uh, allowed me to sleep through the night for the first time in, in more than a decade. Right? Because, I mean, this didn't shut off when I slept. Or tried to sleep. Um, anyway. Um, over that same period of time, especially early on after this head injury, uh, I experienced some personality changes. Um, these gradually reversed, um, but I did have kind of a period from, you know, definitely 2000, 2001, when the fight occurred, through, let's say, you know, when was I back to like pretty fully back to my normal personality it might have been 10 years later um and uh you know i just kind of thought that i'd gone through a phase where i got very uh very depressed a lot of my tastes and everything kind of changed for a little while um but by the time that i had kind of like come back to myself um as it were i realized just how weird the shift had been um, anyway, I mean, that's so vague and amorphous, but, but a lot of that is pretty, pretty personal. Uh, and, and has affected my life in other ways, right? Because as I've kind of like come back to what, what genuinely feels like my, my like original real personality, um, you know, decisions that I made during a period when I was kind of cloudier are, are, they still affect me. Uh, so, anyway, all of this kind of led to a big denouement, at least so far, um, only, only some days ago, as I record this, um, in January 2019. I had a cold the first week of the new year, and, uh, you know, standard cold, runny nose, sore throat, headache, that kind of stuff. The cold subsided. But then, uh... Sunday, a couple days after the cold had subsided, I felt this headache coming back really bad. Um, so I, uh, you know, I, I, I ended up in bed real early, slept through the night, got up the next morning feeling even worse. Headache, terrible vomiting. Uh, I don't vomit very much, so it was really kind of a, a big deal. And I thought, you know what, I better drive myself to the hospital. This is pretty bad. But I couldn't drive myself um, because I was so dizzy and nauseous. 
So I called uh, my assistant Stella and I said, hey, can you drive me to urgent care? Um, so Stella drove me to urgent care and um, they thought my cold was just coming back. So they gave me some anti-nausea medicine and, and I went back to bed. But then two days later, Tuesday, it had just gotten worse and worse. I mean, I had what people describe as a migraine and was still horribly nauseous. So I realized there was still something wrong. So I'd still drive me to the urgent care again. And they said, you know, do you have some kind of underlying condition that uh, we should be worried about? And I said, well, yeah, I have diabetes insipidus. And they said, oh, like caused by damage to your pituitary gland? And I said, yeah. And they said, hmm. So they did some blood work and they said, oh my God, you're dying of hyponatremia. So, right, um, uh, dangerously low sodium. So they said, we're gonna put you on an ambulance to, to send you to the ER. But I said, no, 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 I'm not paying for that. Uh, you know, even with insurance, I'm not paying for that ambulance ride. Um, Stella drove me to the ER. So went to the ER, you know, of course I walk up to the nurse at the front desk. It's like, uh, you know, what's your problem? Like, uh, well, a headache and I'm nauseous. It's like, uh-huh, right, she's clearly bored. So this is some kind of underlying condition that makes us serious. I said, yeah, I have uh, central diabetes insipidus. She said, oh, so they have, you know, suddenly I'm on a, on a hospital bed with tubes running out of all parts of me. You know, my, my right arm is still only just coming back from being shaved like a poodle where they had all these attachments in me. And I got to stay in, in uh, the ICU from Tuesday to Friday as they gradually raised uh, my sodium back up. And it turned out that part of, part of this problem was that I had been overdosing on, on, on vasopressin, right? I've been taking too much. Um, and, and, you know, it, it partly <laughs> I, had, I had suffered from a lack of counsel because the endocrinologist I was consulting with was in was was at a pretty distant place and so I wasn't I wasn't visiting very often and uh, was you know kind of deciding myself how often I wanted to take this nose spray um, because it allowed me to function normally you know it turns out that I kind of have to accept that during parts of the day and, and night unfortunately um, you know I just have to, to live with my default for now until we can figure out exactly how much of the hormone I can take. But anyway, so I wind up in the ICU to get my sodium back to normal. And uh, possibly for the first time in, in, in 18 years, my sodium was back to normal because of course your electrolytes are gonna fluctuate a lot and always be kind of in a desperate position when you, are, when you can't retain liquid. And I noticed, and this is a big deal, I mean, by, by Wednesday, you know, after I'd had my first horrible night in the ICU, screaming at the nurse to kill me, <laughs> right? Um, it was a bad night, I apologized later. Um, you know, I, I noticed that not just my headache from my brain swelling from hyponatremia uh, that put me in the hospital was, was gone, but this background headache that I've been living with for so long was gone, and it's never come back since I was in the ICU. Um, I feel clearer headed. I feel, I feel smarter in a dumb way. That sounds, that sounds wrong, but you know, it, it, it's a dumb thing. It sounds like a dumb thing to say, but I g genuinely feel smarter. Um, you know, and, and the nephrologist that I spoke with at, at the ICU said, well, this may be the first time you've had normal sodium levels since, since you were in high school. So maybe this is Maybe you've just been living with this persistent headache that became just background noise to you for, for all these years. So that's interesting. And uh, certainly I welcome the clear headed feeling that I've had since then. For those who might worry about my well being, uh, I now have a general practice doctor very familiar with this condition. I have a, an endocrinologist and a nephrologist that are all. Uh, close by and uh, we're now doing monthly checkups on my blood work to make sure that my electrolytes don't uh, don't hit dangerous levels again so I'm fine and going forward I should be fine and um, you know I accomplished a fair amount in my life I guess uh, while I was just fighting through a persistent headache and and through um, 
all of this. So maybe going forward with this better managed and with that persistent forever headache gone, maybe I can do more. We'll see. I certainly feel better. But if there's a moral to this story, and I think there kind of is, take a concussion seriously. Right? Don't, don't just wave it off when you're offered a brain scan. Insist on a brain scan if you get a concussion. You need to make sure that you don't deal with what I dealt with for almost two decades without any sort of medical help. Um, because it, it can screw things up. I mean, I was a very pers I've always been pretty persistent, pretty, pretty tenacious, I think, and so I've been able to sort of fight through this. Um, but I wouldn't ask someone else to have to fight through it. Well, that is my head injury story. May you profit from it. And uh, if you have the schadenfreude of some of my students, or surely some of my other haters, I, uh, perhaps you've enjoyed the story of me getting the tar beaten out of me. Who knows? But for now, as usual, from beautiful Colorado, I'm wishing you all the best. Mm -hmm.